Hi everyone, my name is Mr Barlow and welcome to episode 30 of the VCE Biology Podcast. This episode covers part of Unit 3, Area of Study 2, and I'll be talking about pathogens and the way that pathogens can cause infection and disease within the body. So this episode's about infection and disease. So a disease is something that impairs the function of an individual or an organism in some way. So basically what it does is diseases harm organisms or individuals. And there are two main types of diseases. There are inherited diseases, and these are diseases which are passed down in DNA, so children get them from their parents. For example, sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis are inherited diseases or genetic disorders. The other type of disease is an infectious disease. So infectious diseases are caused by things called pathogens. So a pathogen may be a non-cellular agent, and the example of these uh, is prions or viruses. Pathogens can be cellular and uh, or microorganisms, such as bacteria or fungi, and there are even multicellular pathogens, such as you know worms or ticks or something like that. So basically, a, a pathogen is a parasite that causes harm or damages the host that it infects. They're bad things. So the first group of pathogens I'll talk about are prions. And a prion is an infectious agent that is composed of protein. So prions are most famous for their role in neurological diseases, which are also called transmissible, spongiform encephalopathies. <clears throat> and the most famous one of these is in uh, bovines or cows. The most famous one is mad cow disease, which can be transmitted to humans. So if we get infected by a defective prion, prions can convert normal proteins into a prion protein. And this is kind of the way that prions replicate themselves. So the chain of amino acids that make up the prion protein are folded in a different and abnormal way, and they're capable of changing normal proteins into prion proteins. And when a prion infects a cell, it converts other proteins in the cell into prions, so that eventually the cell will burst and it will release those extra prions, which are then free to infect other cells in the body. So that's how it will start causing the disease. So another group of non-cellular pathogens are viruses. And viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. So obligate kind of means have to. Intracellular means within the cell. So basically that means that viruses must infect a host cell before they can reproduce. So viruses, they do contain either DNA or RNA, you know, the genetic material, and it's enclosed in a protein coat. But they lack the protein-making machinery of normal prokaryotic or eukaryotic cells. So because they lack that machinery, they must infect a cell and use that cell's resources to reproduce. Now, different viruses can infect humans and animals and plants and bacteria but in most cases, the virus is host-specific. So that means a particular virus only causes a particular disease in only one type of organism. For example, some of the human viral diseases is the common cold, uh, influenza or the flu, measles, chickenpox, cold sores, mumps, rubella, and AIDS or the acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And there's also viruses that infect other organisms. For example, bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. So viruses must enter a host cell to reproduce, and they use the components of the host cell as a source of energy, and they use the host cell material to make new viruses and assemble new viruses in the host cell, and then they ultimately destroy the host cell, and the viruses are released to infect other cells. So because viruses enter host cells, so they're in cells when they're causing damage, it's really difficult to inhibit the reproduction of a virus without interfering with the way the host cell works, without interfering with the metabolism of the host cell. So as a result of all that, it's actually quite difficult to develop drugs against viruses. Obviously, we have been successful with some. So there's a immunization for uh, chickenpox, and there's an immunization for uh, measles, mumps, and rubella. But we're having a bit of difficulty uh, producing immunizations for all viruses. For example, the virus HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, which causes AIDS. Uh, we're trying quite hard to develop an immunization for HIV, but we're having a little bit of difficulty.
Now, back to uh, pathogens, the smallest known infectious particle is something called a viroid. So a viroid is basically a very short piece of naked RNA. To date, viroids have only been conclusively identified as pathogens of plants, and similar to viruses, they also require the host cell's machinery so that they can reproduce and replicate. Now, another type of pathogen is bacteria. So bacteria are single-celled prokaryotic organisms. Interestingly, bacteria have a really bad name. You know, people think of them as bugs, and all bugs are bad. But in fact, most bacteria are really good. You've got about 10 times as many bacteria in your body and on you know, your skin as you've got human cells. So you've got trillions and trillions of bacteria in and on you, and they actually help you in your everyday you know, functioning. So bacteria overall are good, but some bacteria are pathogenic. Now there are lots of different types of bacteria, and different bacteria have got slightly different structures and shapes. So for example, uh, some bacteria are round in their shape, and round bacteria are called coccus, so examples are uh, staphylococci or streptococci. Some bacteria have a rod shape, so it's you know more of a, a, a very long oval shape. Rod shaped bacteria are called bacillus. Some bacteria form a kind of a spiral shape, and these bacteria are called spirochates, so different bacteria have different shapes. Some bacteria have a structure called a flagella, and this is kind of like a swimming paddle. It's a little bit of um, fiber, I suppose, that comes out of the bacteria and helps it to swim around. Some bacteria have a special layer called a capsule, which is outside the cell wall. It's kind of a slimy, uh, gelatinous layer. Some bacteria you know, don't have flagella. Some bacteria don't have capsules. Some bacteria form spores, and these are basically reproductive structures, and, and they're resistant to drying out uh, so that they, you know, the bacteria can last a long time before it reproduces. Uh, different types of bacteria have got cell walls made up of slightly different things. So some bacteria have cell walls made up mostly of disaccharides and amino acids, and they also have a layer of what's called tachoic acid. Uh, and these bacteria actually, when you put a special stain on them called the gram stain, those bacteria stain positive, so they're called gram positive. Different other bacteria have cell walls made mostly of lipid compounds, so fats, and they don't stain with the gram stain, so they're called gram negative bacteria. The gram stain is actually really useful in indicating uh, <clears throat> which drugs are going to be most useful in treating uh, a pathogenic bacteria. So continuing on with different uh, bacterial characteristics, uh, different bacteria have different metabolic requirements. So some bacteria, in fact most, are aerobic, which means that they grow and live in the presence of oxygen. Some bacteria are anaerobic, which means they can live without oxygen. Uh, of those anaerobic bacteria, some of them are called obligate anaerobes, which means they have to and can only survive uh, in an environment where there's no oxygen, whereas facultative anaerobes can survive in anaerobic conditions, i.e. with no oxygen, but they can also survive when there's oxygen around. Different bacteria have different nutritional patterns, so you know the way they, they get food can be slightly different. Some bacteria are, are, like plants, photosynthetic, which means they can convert the sunlight, that, that light, into chemical energy. Some bacteria are chemosynthetic, which means that they uh, basically break down other inorganic molecules as a source of energy. And bacteria can also be autotrophic or heterotrophic. So autotrophs use carbon dioxide to create their own, make their own food, whereas heterotrophs basically consume uh, food from somewhere else. So you can see that bacteria can be very, very different in their shape and the different structures they've got and the way that they work in terms of their physiology. And in fact, the ability to, ability to correctly identify a particular bacteria, and in, you know, in our examples, a pathogenic bacteria, is really important before we start treating someone who's you know, infected with something. So different bacteria can be very, very different, and most bacteria is in fact good, but of course some bacteria can cause disease. And basically bacteria can cause disease if they can enter a person who acts as a host, so that's if they can be transmitted to a person. 
Bacteria, if they're going to cause disease, they also have to be able to reproduce in the host. So one bacteria doesn't cause disease. It's going to be millions of bacteria which end up causing a disease. And of course, for bacteria to cause a disease, they have to, they have to cause some harm to the tissue which they've infected. They have to impair the function to the organism in some way. And so to expand on those ideas a little bit, bacteria can be transmitted from one person to another through, for example, little droplets when a person coughs or when they sneeze or when they transfer other bodily fluids. Uh, a bacterial transmission can occur when people share the same cup or there's infected food or there's some bacteria growing in some particular food. Uh, pathogenic bacteria can also be carried from one host to another. So if a human's the host, then an insect could carry some bacteria to the human. Uh, and in this case, the insect is called a vector. So a vector can carry pathogenic bacteria from one host to the next. And so once bacteria have been transmitted to, to a new uninfected host, they have to be able to reproduce in that host to uh, then be able to cause a disease. And to reproduce, uh, they, they have to have a, a, an appropriate environment, and that means you know, not too hot, not too cold, uh, the appropriate pH. Uh, they've got to have enough water. They've got to have the right amount of nutrients. And if the conditions are right for the bacteria, bacteria can replicate every 20 minutes. So in a very short period of time, you can have lots and lots of bacteria or enough to you know, cause disease. So once the bacteria has been transmitted, then, then once it reproduces, again, to cause a disease, it has to, has, an, has to have an adverse effect on tissue. So many pathogenic bacteria uh, produce toxins, and, and these are the things which damage the host tissue. So one type of toxin is an exotoxin, and these are released from the bacteria as they grow. Uh, and these can be really bad to the host, so they can do things like inhibit host protein synthesis or damage host cell membranes or interfere with the normal nerve function of the host, so, you know, the human most likely. Some other toxins are endotoxin, so exo is, you know, external, endo is within. Uh, when bacteria produce endotoxins, when the bacterial cell lyses and dies, you know, so when it breaks open, those endotoxins are released and they have an adverse effect on the host. So you can see that if bacteria can be transmitted to a host, if they can then reproduce in the host, and then if they basically start damaging tissue, things can turn pretty nasty. Now obviously, if a person gets infected with some pathogenic bacteria, it'd be really handy if we had a way to treat them so that we could cure them of their disease. Fortunately, scientists have done some really great work in, in the treatment of bacterial diseases. In particular, they've developed a range of uh, chemicals, and these are called antibiotics. So antibiotics are basically things which kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria. So some antibiotics or antibacterial chemicals are called narrow spectrum, which means they only act on, on a few bacteria, on a, a limited variety of microorganisms, whereas other antibiotics are called broad spectrum, which means they kill or you know, destroy a large number of different bacteria. So a, a pretty famous antibiotic is one called penicillin, which you may have heard of. Penicillin was actually discovered by a famous guy, a famous scientist called Alexander Fleming, uh, and he didn't think you could use it in people. But then an Australian guy called Howard Florey did a few scientific experiments, and he discovered that penicillin was in fact this great drug or great chemical that we could use to cure people of a, a great many bacterial diseases. So the development of antibiotics has been just a fantastic scientific discovery. But if a person is infected with a bacterial pathogen, you don't just give them any antibiotic. First of all, you need to decide which antibiotic is going to be the most successful at helping to cure the disease. And to do that, often we perform a sensitivity test. And to do that, you, you basically get the bacteria and uh, expose it to a number of different antibiotics. And the antibiotic which inhibits the growth of the bacteria the most is obviously going to be the antibiotic which has you know, the worst effect on the bacteria. And the antibiotic which has the worst effect on the bacteria is going to do the best job of killing it. And so then that will be the drug that is used to help cure a patient. So I've spoken about prions and viruses and bacteria, but another group of, of pathogens is eukaryotic pathogens. So eukaryotic pathogens can be single-celled, for example, amoeba or protozoan parasites such as those that cause malaria. 
and they can also be uh, multicellular organisms that act as eukaryotic pathogens. For example, cat, uh, cattle ticks, which affect livestock, or lice, which affect, you know, infect the heads of humans. Uh, some fungi are eukaryotic pathogens, uh, so you might have some fungus growing uh, between your toes. Uh, these kind of parasites that live on, live on the host are called ectoparasites, so lots of fungi would be ectoparasites. Uh, the most common infections in plants are in fact fungal infections. Fortunately, uh, at least in humans, uh, we've developed some chemicals that can kill fungi, so these you know, chemicals that cure fungal-based uh, diseases are called fungicides. So other ectoparasites, you know, parasites that live on the surface of their host, uh, things, you know, things like head lice in humans or crabs. Uh, mosquitoes are interesting because they don't actually cause disease or, you know, more often than not malaria. They're actually vectors, so they carry the malarial protozoans uh, from one host to the next so that, you know, they don't, they don't cause malaria, but they certainly are a carrier of it. Another type of eukaryotic pathogen, a multicellular organism, is uh, worms. So in humans you can get roundworms or tapeworms and these grow in your gut uh, and they're no good to have. It's, it's all quite disgusting really. But these parasites like worms that live inside you, uh, they're referred to as endoparasites. So ectoparasites live on the surface of the host, endoparasites live inside the host. Uh, worms can actually also infect plant species. Um, they live inside plant tissue and cause damage to a plant. An interesting group of diseases is sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> really interesting. Um, the reason interesting is because they've by and large increased in their frequency over the last you know, 50 years or so, whereas most diseases have, have decreased in frequency. Uh, there are lots of different types of STDs or sexually transmitted diseases. There's sexually transmitted diseases caused by bacterial pathogens uh, like gonorrhea and syphilis. There's bacterial diseases caused by viruses, for example AIDS or genital, genital herpes. Some, bac some sexually transmitted diseases are caused by a fungus like thrush uh, and there are even uh, sexually transmitted diseases caused by arthropods, so multicellular pathogens uh, and pubic lice or, or crabs is, is another example of that. It's disgusting, really. So clearly it's really important to try and stop the spread of diseases and pathogens. And Australia's Quarantine Service does a really good job of protecting Australia's unique flora and fauna from the spread of diseases from other countries. Uh, we, you know, we quarantine pets when they come into the country. As a result of Australia's strict quarantine laws, Australia is one of the very few countries in the world without rabies. Uh, it's also free of foot and mouth disease. No Australian cattle have got mad cow disease, so Australian Quarantine Service does a really, really good job. Uh, we've also in Australia got you know controls to stop the spread of diseases which are already in the country. So quite a lot of work happens in Australia to ensure that diseases don't come into the country to affect you know humans, but also livestock and crops. And we also do a good job of controlling diseases once they're here. It's a really important job. And that brings episode 30 of the VCE Biology podcast to a close. I'm Mr Barlow, and thanks for listening.